everybody. Happy Sunday and welcome to episode six of the Stock Trading Pit season four. Today we have four segments as always with segment one being talking with traders with our guest Matt AK Moonshine and myself. Segment two is going to be the broad market review going over some broad market ETFs as well as some crypto and maybe a couple metal names as well. Segment three is going to be the watch list with Theta Warrior and myself going over some different names going into the next couple of weeks. And then segment four is going to be the Twitter weekend chart requests. So sit back, relax, and let's jump right into it. All righty, let's jump into the segment talking with traders with Matt, aka Moonshine on Twitter. And today we're just going to talk about how Matt got into the markets, what he trades, how he trades, and all that good stuff. So Matt, thank you so much for joining us today and looking forward to uh, learning a little more about your trading style and how you got started. Thanks for having me, Jake. Uh, excited to talk with you guys a little bit about that. Awesome. Well, um, first question, you know, starting out, how did you get into trading? I know you like to trade stocks. I know you like to trade crypto. Um, how did you get into the markets uh, in general, both on the stock and the crypto side? Well, I was majoring in economics and finance in undergrad, and uh, I had previously been passively invested in some blue chips for a few years, uh, like an account that my dad started for me when I was, you know, like 14 or 15 or something. Uh, but I wanted to get some exposure and some real practice with the markets before trying to get into either investment banking or institutional trading or something like that after college. Uh, so I did stumble onto some pot stocks at that first stage, and there were only like five or six of them at the time, like MJNA, ERBB, Medbox. And this is like 2011 or 2012. Uh, so I started to trade those. Uh, and I had some ups and downs with those, like most traders do to start. Uh, and then I did hit some big trades during the 2014 pot stock mania. And, uh, and then uh, after doing that for a while, I did start to pivot to the larger cap stocks as that initial pop bubble started to pop. Um, and then seeing most of those pot stocks go to zero was a big reason why I put so much time into trying to create a technical trading system, because I just saw that you know, some things do go to zero. So you do need a, some, some sets of rules to keep you, you know, on, on the straight and narrow. Um, and then anyway, uh, after college, I worked at JP Morgan for a couple of years. Um, wasn't, wasn't really too passionate about that. Uh, and then I eventually went to law school. Uh, and then after graduating from law school, I got my series 65. And then for the last several years, I've traded full time. Uh, I do run an outside book and then I run my trading service. And then these days I trade pretty much any type of stock. I, I do still watch those pot stocks closely, but I trade pretty much anything now. Uh, and then as for crypto, the first crypto trades that I made were in the 2018 bear market. Uh, so I had been paying a little bit of attention to it for the couple of years before that, back to, uh, I guess, when Bitcoin did the run up to 1,000 and then back down to 250. I think that was 2014 to 2016. I was watching, paying a little bit of attention, but I kind of didn't know enough about it to feel comfortable trading it. Uh, but then once the 2017 bubble popped and I saw uh, Bitcoin get back down to like seven, six K, you know, I started to buy there. I was early, but uh, I did, you know, buy through that bear market low and ultimately traded through that, you know, up through 10 to 14 K a couple of times before that big breakout. Um, the f yeah. So as I learned more about a lot of that crypto stuff for, for a while, what attracted me to that was just the volatility. But now that I've kind of, gotten a little more entrenched in that i see that there's a lot of fundamental value to some of those coins and to DeFi in general so definitely excited to keep crypto on my you know my trading slate for a while awesome and as far as trading goes do you have a specific um style or, or it, does it matter if it's stocks or crypto swing trading versus day trading or is it just really all about the market conditions at the time whether it's a day trade or a swing trade or anything like that uh, for me, it pretty much all is going to ultimately come down to swing trades, but I do build positions, you know, in a little more piecemeal fashion. So I might, I might, you know, buy six or seven times in, in, in scaling. And so it might feel like scalping to some people, but it's usually just massaging the position. Um, so, you know, when I see a tradable low form and a lot of times what I'll do is I will look for multi-year, you know, very solidly uptrending stocks that have a period of weakness that brings them back down to what I call an active average or you know a lot of times the VWAP ends up being that average um but basically just brings it back down to some point of reference that i can trade again and uh you know I, i'm not typically trying to buy breakouts i'm not typically trying to buy you know momentum plays as they're running i'm, I'm much more about calmly putting the swing positions together i'm usually early you know on my first buys 
but I'm usually buying through the low ultimately before I'm done. So that, that has worked out for me pretty well. Um, you know, sometimes it ends up being you're scalping, you know, a big range and, you know, you think a big move is coming, but ultimately to keep the position cost basis somewhere where you're, you feel comfortable, you're going to have to keep trimming a little bit, you know, when it's up a few percent a day and buying some back when it's down a few percent. Um, so I don't really look at that as scalping. I just kind of look at that as massaging the swing trades until they're ready for the bigger move. But I do do a lot of that. You know, I don't just hold throughout the whole the whole move. Um, I do often tell people to look high time frame down, which to me means, you know, you're going to want to look at your monthly charts, your weekly charts and your daily charts and kind of put your uh, your emphasis on how valuable they are in that order. Um, assuming that you have a, you know, a long enough time frame and you're not trying to just day trade. But so when I'm taking my most important swing trades i'm always making sure that the monthly chart looks great you know ideally my best trades come when all three of the time frames are aligned but you know if you don't have the weekly and monthly looking good you're you know you're just trading a, you know for very small little moves on the daily chart and typically you're not going to make the big money that way so that, that's for the most part how i try to do my position trading and i i do a lot of the same with crypto you know whereas the stocks i will take a whole bunch of positions though with crypto i'm, I'm usually going to keep it to two, three, four positions, have them very concentrated and, and do that same type of massaging style pretty actively with them. Okay. So kind of trading around a core position type. type yeah, I definitely trade around a core a lot. Awesome. Awesome. So as far as kind of what you're trading, I know crypto is kind of its own world on the stock side of things. Is there anything that's interesting to you right now going into the rest of the summer, into the fall? Um, are there, are there any, you know, monthly charts that are setting up into the next couple months that you're really keeping an eye on? Yeah, as of today, you know, I'd say some of the early themes, you know, off those May lows have started to play out a little bit like software and genomics. We were, you know, very interested in those. Those have played well. I still think those will continue to do well. You know, I, I'd probably be more overweight soft software now after the genomics day the other day. And um, but I think right now the focus is still on mega cap tech. So you're going to be looking at things like Amazon. You're going to be looking at Netflix and Apple. You know, those don't sound like the sexiest names to a lot of people, especially people who only play stock. But, you know, you need for, for the market to be healthy overall and for the breadth to return, you really do need those type of leading stocks to be acting well. So right now, that's the focus. I do think we are right about to be, you know, over the next week or two, I think moving to overweight China names. You know, I love Baba. Everybody knows I like Baba a lot. Um, but I would I would consider taking positions in a few other, you know, Baidu, Vips, um, you know, there's a couple other Chinese names that are definitely worth considering. JD is quality. Um, so I think China's, it, it, you know, it, could you see another week or two of pressure um, as this kind of uh, the news from China on the regulatory front starts to just kind of fizzle out? Sure. But I think overall, if you're taking a high time frame down view, you're going to see that, you know, six months from now, 12 months from now, China has likely outperformed, you know, many other groups. And especially names like Baba and Baidu are likely going to be much higher than where they are now. Love it. And so are you looking at the oh, macros? Are you looking at the macro side or when you're looking at these Chinese names, is it mostly focused on the chart or is it mostly a kind of a mix of the chart as well as some of the fundamentals as well? Yeah, when you're looking at the China names, it's kind of complicated because you're looking at them, but you have to keep in mind that there's always going to be this discount, at least until things are really changed over there. So yeah, Baba, if you look at its fundamentals, looks wildly cheap. And so people who like fundamentals, you know, are, are, are can point to that very quickly and say, oh, they, the fundamentals look great. I think it's kind of a combination of that. The fundamentals are outrageously cheap right now. It's testing its, you know, lifelong trend for the last like four or five years. It's always seemed to bounce around this 40 month MA, um, which is about where it's trading now. And for me personally, in this in this context, the sentiment, which is where you really need to play China, is right where you want to buy you know you don't want to be buying china when everyone thinks it's doing great you want to buy china when everyone thinks that it's going to close its stock market and it's going to make its biggest company go under you know what i mean so i, I feel like baba right now if you take that high time frame down view and a lot of those other you know quality china names i'm not saying to go out and buy whatever the new china ipo is of the week but if you buy the quality china names the tier ones i think that will work out and i like i like the fact that Maybe it's just because I kind of have that style too, but the fact that you're really not, you know, buying the breakouts, buying the the momentum. I, I think I remember back a couple months ago, and I think we were both kind of saying, "All right, Fubo's getting close to bottoming here." And uh, you know, that was be that was that was back when everybody hated Fubo and thought Fubo was going to zero. So 
it's it's kind of cool to see that you you stick with the plan you don't have to see confirmation by other people to get in you do your thing you set your swings um you know in a scaling process and so um you know for for a new trader who's on fin twitter someone who's just you know new to the whole process what would be um some advice that you would give them as far as just overall trading and just overall kind of what to look for um on on FinTwit and all these other resources, stock twits, all these, all of these channels that they can go on and get information. What, what is your advice to them? Well, uh, the first thing I think is just to appreciate the difficulty of trading, because I mean, especially in the social media age, I think, you know, maybe some people have lost track of the fact that it's, it's not easy. You know, people are going to post games, people, you know, someday, every, you know, some person someday, every day is always going to do great. So if someone's out there on Twitter posting something, yeah, it's his day. Don't fall into the trap of thinking that everybody is making money every day, you know, and, and a lot of people are, you know, message yeah. me and say, oh, I, I, you know, I'm only up a couple percent or I'm not doing so great yet. How do I, you know, level up? And a lot of times it's, you know, people really haven't looked at what this is and it's not easy. And if you want to be excellent at it, it's going to take a huge amount of work. And a lot of people who aren't going to put that work in, there are a lot less expensive ways that they can have fun, you know, but for the people who hear that and say, no, I'm ready to put in the work. I really want to be an excellent trader. You know, then you try to find a mentor, somebody who's done it for a long time and, you know, who, who's become in their own way financially independent through trading. I think that, you know, not every single person who has something valuable to teach in trading has yet become financially independent. But if the person has done it, it usually means they have something that either about their process or their mindset that's allowed them to do that. And it might be something that you can learn from. So I do think finding mentors like that is valuable. You know, you're going to want to you're going to want to avoid mentors who try to sound too smart. And, you know, there are a lot of people out there who can say, who can weave really nice analysis and then it just doesn't work. And, you know, so you want to find somebody who can make that strong analysis, but who can make it at a base level and then who can execute it. And you see the results in the form of them actually profiting. You know, there's a lot of different steps to trading and there's a a lot of good chartists that aren't good traders and a lot of good analysts that aren't good traders. So you just want to make sure that the person you're following has all the pieces that you're looking for. Um, you know, more generally, all new traders should avoid margin and leverage, and they should all stop buying out the money calls, and they should pretty much just stop, stop tra- trading options altogether for the first few years. Uh, stick to common stock and stick to stocks that are in multi-year uptrends. I mean, those would be the most basic things I could say to new traders. I would say that's great advice. I, I even did a post today about options. I, I've seen so many people trading, people that I know from years ago, high school saying they're they're now options traders and i'm like you know kind of thinking to myself well you started two weeks ago and i i don't i don't confidently think that you could tell me what an options contract is so i'm right there with you i definitely think uh the the market is just uh full of these newer traders uh trading options and a lot of people are getting hit and um you know the out of the money uh options i've mentioned was also something you know a lot of people uh will say well yeah, next week, the stock X could be at $15. So I'm going to buy $16 out of the money calls. Well, if you buy them now, and then next week, you're 50 cents away, you're still getting hit on that every time. Just because maybe it's at $15 that next Friday doesn't mean you're actually going to make money. So I think that's a big misconception as well. So I'm glad you touched on that. Um, last thing, uh, anything that you want to mention to everyone about your trading service and how they can find information on it and all that good stuff. Cool. Yeah. I do have a couple new projects in the works. I can't say anything too much about it right now, but I'm hoping that I'll be able to share some stuff on Twitter over the next couple of weeks or months. Uh, but at the moment, if anyone is interested in getting, uh, info on my trading service, uh, moonshine trades, they can just reach out to me on Twitter at moon underscore shine 15 and I'll send that information over. Love it. Well, uh, hey, thank you so much for coming on and talking uh, a little bit about how you got started. And everyone remember to definitely give Matt a follow on Twitter. He posts all the time and uh, really, really provides some great information. So um, you know where to find him. He's got that service if you are interested. And uh, Matt, thank you so much for your time today. Thanks for having me, Jake. I really appreciate it. Hey, thank you. All right, let's move on to the next segment. Alrighty, let's look at the broad markets going into the week ahead, really into mid-July, starting with SPY as always. So, um, you know, we had a pretty classic breakout 
at the end of June through this ascending wedge. And you can see that we moved right up to this 1.618 extension, right around 4.33 or so before pulling back pretty hard this week, almost testing perfectly this, uh, this previous resistance line, which would then be acting as support. Now, notice that it did not actually touch this area. So all you need to do is go in and create an alert with sensitivity around these types of levels so you're not getting just a precise level you're getting a zone and that's how you would have been able to create an alert on this previous resistance that was acting as a support this week and really just a huge move up on friday and so um you know we actually broke through the 1.618 extension now going into next week and then on the weekly side of things you can see here that this volume shelf um, that had been forming for quite a while finally acted as a nice launch pad for price and continues to uh, really be a nice launch pad. If we did pull back for whatever reason, this would be your level of support below, let's say around 420. Now on the seasonality side of things, you can definitely see July has a very strong win rate. So based on the price action and seasonality right now, it wouldn't shock me if we continued up, but we'll just have to see what happens into the weeks to come. Now the cues are very similar here. Um, except the fact that we have this very, very tight ascending wedge forming here. You can see here that we're getting pretty close um, to getting really tight here, not actually close to the apex yet, but um, we are starting to get up there as far as uh, you know tightness goes. We're gonna have to either break to the upside or the downside here. And another way to let the system watch these areas for you is just right click, create an alert at both of these lines, and then just let the price action do its thing whenever it closes above or below. One of these lines, you'll be alerted and you know it's time to start looking at the chart again. Now, on the weekly side of things, I've anchored the volume weighted average, uh, excuse me, the volume buy price, um, and we can anchor the VWAP uh, as well from this point. And you'll see here that over the last couple of weeks, we finally did kind of launch off this launch pad volume shelf here. And really, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight weeks in a row, we've closed green. So that's uh, a little crazy. Um, generally, you want to see a little bit of a red kind of candle in there every now and then for a reset, but you can see we've just continued higher. We closed almost perfectly at this 1.618 extension above or tested, didn't close at it on Friday, but we were very close to actually testing it. And so this could be an area of resistance going into the weeks ahead, especially after this big of a move to the upside. Uh, and we'll have to see if we actually do get that pullback. But it would honestly be healthy at this point. Now on the seasonality side, you can also see that July and August have very strong win rates. And so the price action is really following uh, the seasonality for now so far in July. Now going into IWM, IWM is one that has definitely had some trouble over the last uh, six months to break out or do something. It's just been range bound here uh, within this horizontal area. You can see here on the weekly side of things, if we anchor the volume by price from the COVID lows, you'll see that we do have this uh, volume shelf forming very similar to the Qs and SPY. And so is this kind of a lagging um, ETF to the uh, SPY and the Qs? We'll just have to see, but same thing for July, very high uh, win rate for July with a 100% win rate, which simply just means that over the last five years, every July has closed higher than June. So just uh, that's how you can read these 100% win rates. That doesn't mean there's a 100% chance this actually closes green on um, uh, for the month of July. However, um, if we do get a nice bounce and break out, that would look pretty good going into the second half of July. And we'll just have to see if we actually get that breakout here. And that would be right around 232 we'd need to close above. Uh, so that is IWM. And let's quickly look at VIX just to get an idea of seasonality. The chart, I mean, is is kind of just continuing to melt over the last year or so or more. And you can see here, uh, Friday, we did have a really strong move to the downside, which is right in line with uh, Friday having a really weak seasonality um, win rate. Fridays only have a 23% win rate. So definitely the weakest day of the week so far in 2021. And if you look back... Uh, since 2016, you can see July also has a very poor win rate with only a 20% uh, win rate for July. But notice August has a 100% win rate, which means that August closes higher than July's close 100% of the time, at least over the last five years. So we'll have to see if we do get a little volatility or turbulence going into August. 
But for now, um, you can see that we are starting to uh, really come to these levels that the VIX has been at for the last 10 years, which is right around this 12 to 13 area. So we'll see if we do melt down all the way that low or if we do get a bounce. Um, going into SLV, we'll look at some metals here, SLV and GLD. Um, since the last time we looked at this chart, there really hasn't been anything that's happened. We still have the gap above. Remember, if you want to look at these gaps, you can always just turn on the gap snake and you'll see here that we did fill it a little bit in early July, but you can see here that we did pull back. We still have some of that gap left. And remember, you can always just create an alert at the bottom of the gap or the top of the gap to know when that gap is fully filled or it is starting to fill. So uh, that is the daily side of things. The downside, uh, we do actually have, I think, a, uh, a gap below as well. So we do have gaps. I'll have to change the gap factor to point two here. And you'll see we do have a gap below as well. So uh, we'll have to see which way this goes and which gap does fill. But you can see here around 23.65 is your gap below. Now, on the weekly side of things, you'll see here that we do have this little volume shelf forming here from the, uh, the COVID lows. And so for now, the price is respected this area. Uh, and you can see here that July has an 80% win rate. Uh, so one of the stronger months of the year so far, um, at least for the fi last five years, we'll have to see if we actually bounce or continue down um, from here. But going into August and September, you do see a little bit of a decrease in that win rate. Now, going into GLD, a pretty similar chart to SLV, you can see here that we still have this gap above uh, that we haven't fully filled. So um, let me change this to the 0.6 so we can get rid of some of these smaller uh, gaps. And you can see here that this gap has not fully filled yet, but we're getting there. If you do want to go ahead and let's say be alerted when the gap fully fills, just right click on the top of the gap snake. Um, you don't really need sen uh, sensitivity here. You just need to know when the price actually breaks through that upper part of the gap. And that's when you'll know and you'll get a text or an email saying that the gap is fully filled. So um, you can create alerts on these gap snake uh, levels as well. Now on the weekly side of things, if we start the volume by price from the start of this, uh, this trend, you'll see here that we did bounce almost perfectly off this shelf, which was in uh, kind of confluence with this trend line. And you'll see here that we are starting to move through this volume gap. You'll see there's not a lot of liquidity above until we get to around, let's say 175 on GLD. So um, same thing here, just definitely a decrease in seasonality going into the end of the summer. And we'll have to see if price action kind of plays, uh, plays out with that. So um, that is it on the metals. Let's look at uh, BTC USD and then we'll look at uh, Ethereum real quick, just as a broad market overview for crypto. And you'll see here that uh, Bitcoin is starting to form a little bit of a symmetrical triangle here. Uh, the question is, is this going to be a bearish kind of uh, breakdown? We've got our move down. We've got the uh, kind of the pennant forming. And then the next move could possibly be down kind of going this way. That's generally kind of what the textbook would say. But this is Bitcoin. We'll just have to see what happens here. So if we do break out, watch for that anchored view app around 38.6, 38, 38.7. Uh, and it, if we did start to break down on the weekly side of things, that COVID low anchored view app would definitely be what you want to keep in mind. That's right around 26.5 uh, to 26.7 below. And uh, the weekly candle close for Bitcoin and Ethereum will definitely be important going into the weeks ahead. Now, one thing to keep in mind, since 2016, since the start of uh, that year, which is the last five years, July only has a 40% win rate and August is one of the worst performing months with only a 20% win rate. So uh, the seasonality at least is starting to uh, align a little more with the bearish thesis than the bullish thesis. So we'll have to see how that plays out. The next one is Ethereum and uh, Ethereum is, is looking a little rough here. I mean, it is holding this swing low anchored view app pretty well. You can see here that we did get a, uh, a little bit of a bounce here over the last day or so. And uh, we'll have to really see if we can hold this swing low anchor view out. Now on the weekly side of things, you definitely want to keep in mind that this longer term support trend line is going to be kind of your status quo. Uh, if you will, if we start to break down through there, that's when things definitely get interesting. And then really going into July and August, 
still pretty weak uh, win rates over the last uh, five years or so. So keep that in mind when you are looking at crypto. The seasonality isn't the best into the next uh, month and a half or so, and we'll just have to see how that plays out. So that is the broad markets. Hopefully these charts were helpful understanding uh, kind of what's possibly going to occur in the next couple of weeks using technical analysis and seasonality. Remember, all of this is just an if-then statement. If this breaks down, then this is the next level to watch. If this breaks out, this is the next level to watch. And that's how you should really look at the markets. Nothing is guaranteed. And that's how you should kind of play it just as price action evolves. So uh, hopefully this was helpful. And let's move on to the next segment. All righty, let's look at the watch list for this week with our special guest, Theta Warrior. Um, Theta is a huge, huge user of the platform, as well as uh, someone I would call a friend. Um, even though we've never met in person, definitely would call him a friend at this point. So um, Theta, welcome to the show. Thank you for coming on. I know we've done a Thursday live stream, but I think this is your first appearance on the Sunday show. Um, so thanks for joining us. And what are you looking at into the next uh, couple weeks to month? Well, thanks again, Jake, for having me on. Pleasure to be here as always. Um, first thing we'll talk about first is the cues, uh, just to kind of get like a broad idea of you know what we're seeing in the market here. This is the weekly chart, um, bounced off the, our 200-week moving average in March, which is a common place for long-term trends to, to touch. And you can see we've just had this absolute insane rip from the lows. And we've had two small little consolidations since then. And from that, we've gotten a similar kind of breakout. So we're, we're kind of, you know, midway to the tail end, I think, coming up on, on this uh, breakout here. And the way I view this is, you know, I'm bullish until proven otherwise. I, I think the market is in melt up mode and it may continue another 50 points, 25 points um, before it comes back down for a small breather. But um, I think... Looking at the daily, I posted this chart earlier. Um, this was kind of our breakout range here. And I'm kind of looking for something like this. It's like a really nice dip buying opportunity because the way I approach the market is I always weigh risk reward. And I have to look at something like this that's, you know, come so far and, you know, possibly getting extended. You know, is the risk reward as good up here as it was down here? You know, the answer is no. So the way I approach this is cautiously and I, you know, I'm selling into the strength, making sure I'm taking profits and pushing up stops because ultimately I think we will have some type of move like this. And I'm going to be a big buyer right there. Uh, if we get a trade down into this 350 range or so, because I think this bull run still has more legs. This is the, the secondary consolidation we were looking at. And I think that this trend will continue, but Looking at this, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that we get a breather somewhat soon that's, that's going to be a nice viable dip. And a lot of people, you know, forget that it's very healthy to pull back to your breakout point. You know, a lot of people say, oh, we're, we're pulling back. Well, yeah, you have to retest your breakout point to continue higher a lot of the time. So, you know, you outline that perfectly with those two uh, yellow arrows. So, um, I'm kind of in the same boat. It's looking a little toppy here. You've seen a lot of disconnect over the last week or so with some of these growth names getting hit. And really a lot of the reason the market is holding up is, you know, your Apples and your Amazons. So, um, you know, if those do turn over, pull back a little bit just to have a breather, you know, that may be the, uh, the short-term kind of pullback zone there. So um, love it. Um, now, as far as, uh, as far as some individual names, I know it's, something you'd like to go over on the queues, definitely as a general overview of, of what's kind of how things are looking, but what are some of the individual names that you're looking at into the next couple of weeks? So Apple is a big one that I've been trading the last month, month and a half. Um, started buying here as we were nearing the bottom of this big consolidation and really stepped on the gas here once we finally got the breakout. So again, similar situation where this has just been a beautiful trade. You know, I've been rolling up and um, hanging on to the majority of my position or as much as I could anyway. And kind of a similar situation where we're approaching this high. The daily to me is looking a little extended. So I actually took off the majority of my position um, this week and looking for somewhat of a retracement possibly to this zone, which has been a big 
area of supply in the past. So, you know, it may continue to break higher. I'm not here to pick a top. What I, one of my rules is to always look to take profits as I'm approaching my target, or at least, you know, put on a trailing stop to protect myself in case there is a pullback. So this was my target, the all time high. Here we are after, you know, how many six, seven, eight days green in a row. So my rule was to put on the trailing stop. So that's what I did. Um, this very well may continue higher. I mean, I expect this to make new all time highs, but like you said, it's healthy for the market to pull back. You know, if we saw a retracement to there, I can't even imagine how many dip buyers would come in. It lets in new blood into the market. You get everyone out that's looking to sell and had a profit. And, you know, the risk reward was just way better down here to be a buyer than it is up here, in my opinion. So that's one that um, I'm watching to see if we are going to get a pullback, you know, in the next few days, week or so. Makes sense. And um, I know you definitely like to focus on the larger cap names. Um, so, you know, Apple's one. Uh, I think I think Amazon's one that you like to follow quite a bit as well. Yes. Amazon is another one. I've just been chomping at the bit watching this thing when it was going to go. And I was noticing this small little grouping last week at the close on Friday and thinking, man, this just looks like it might want to go. And then sure enough, Tuesday, we got that monstrous rip that everyone in their you know, brother has been waiting for this big push higher and, you know, selling into this strength. Uh, today we traded up to the 1.236 extension. So, you know, this may end up continuing higher. I think ultimately we are looking at a huge breakout here. Um, but, you know, if the market is weak, it's going to pull back everything. And you also have to look, this is the weekly chart here. You also have to look at the last time it did a breakout from a big consolidation. This was a fake out and it pulled back down. And then this eventually was the real breakout in which we saw this next, you know, thousand, fifteen point, hundred point run. So I think, you know, maybe there's a potential for something similar to happen again, waiting to see if we're going to get a nice dip to buy here before I really get in too heavy um, and, you know, try and ride this thing all the way up to 4,000. It makes sense to me. Yeah. It's, it's uh, interesting you pointed that out because I mean, it looks very similar, almost maybe a little longer on that previous breakout, but definitely this thing's pretty much done nothing for the last, what was that about? August was that when that can't when when that box starts around there? Or yeah, this this one started in June. This wow. one this one I think measured about eighteen months. So yeah, it, it likes to base for a really long time. Mm -hmm. And then look what results from that. I mean, you get a beautiful thrust. I mean, this is a huge upside trade potential. I think that we're going to get again. It's all just a matter of timing and waiting for the market to give us the best buying opportunity. I think. Yeah, absolutely. All righty, let's move on to the next one. What else are you watching? So Tesla's been a big one, um, you know, really looked like it wanted to go here and then has since decided to pull back. So I'm watching this one to see if maybe this is going to be a fake out and we're going to come down here again. And this is going to be the real buyable dip. Um, I know there's a lot of eyes on Tesla, but seeing this action the last two days has been somewhat disappointing for the bulls. Well, I would say disappointing for the bulls. Um, but again, needed to fill this gap. Um, often they need to retest. This could just be a sloppy retest. We're going to end up bouncing higher here. Um, but really, personally, I don't want to be involved until it does move above this level again, or it starts to show some strength and, and demand, you know, steps in and puts in a bottom down here at the lower end of the consolidation. Makes sense to me. And I see that you're using uh, MACD and then you're also using the, just the RSI there as well. Yes. Yep. Just keeping it simple. Love it. Yeah. So it's interesting to see that MACD may be curling over a little bit. So we'll have to see if that is, you know, noise or if that's something bigger, but um, yeah, no, I love, I love how you keep it simple. And, you know, I think a lot of people try to add so many indicators that, you know, use 10 indicators. One is definitely going to tell you, something that you probably want to see and then maybe the other ones don't and so the more simple that you do it i think the better um same thing for me i like to use the macd for overall trend anchor vwap anchored volume by price and you know maybe sometimes the percent range for some type of divergence but i like how you keep it simple it's easy to follow i think i think that's why uh you know you're you're uh 
your following has just grown so much because you make it easy to see kind of what you're trying to uh, portray to everybody and, and show what's what's going on. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And I definitely do like to keep it simple. I mean, this is really how I view the charts myself. You know, I'll, I'll of course, check the moving averages, but I mean, there's just way too much clutter going on there, in my opinion. So price is the most important indicator, as we know, the 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 other secondary indicators are just simply there to support or deny, you know, the price action that we're seeing. So, yeah, I mean, you bring up a great point. This does look like it's about to flip over. Um, another thing I look at are the sweepers, which have been very bearish the last couple of days. So all of those things in, conjunct in conjunction with looking at price, I think is going to give you the best overall result. There's not one single indicator that's, you know, going to be the end all indicator. You kind of have to look at the whole picture. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's interesting. Tesla definitely is not participating while some of these other ones really are. Um, as far as uh, I think we have time for about two more. What what else are you looking for as far as, uh, you know, maybe some some other larger cap names? Um, Chew oh, it looks like Chewy. Yeah. Chewy's one I've been looking at uh, just because to me, you know, it looks less extended than the rest. I'm all about finding eggs that are about to hatch and less, you know, interested in playing eggs that are you know, full grown chickens, I should, I guess you could say, but I mean, you look at this, you've got an inverse head and shoulders. You've got a, a potential ascending uh, triangle breakout. You know, you've got a successful retest here from this downtrend line. So I see a lot of potential here for more movement to the upside. If it does decide to break out, of course, again, if the market's weak, you know, this doesn't matter. I'm sure it'll roll over too, but this is one that I'm watching for more potential upside. Um, I think that this could be a good one. The other one, large cap, Microsoft, just again, going back to looking at how extended something is, I was participating in all of this move up to the all time high. And then, you know, getting a little weary up here, just even looking at the measured move from this last, you know, very similar symmetrical triangle breakout, we're already way above where this one was, you know, projected, quote unquote, to go. So again, just, you know, in my mind, this is a time to be cautious, uh, protect profits, protect gains, and, you know, don't go crazy and be buying upside calls in something that's already had so much of a run. Absolutely. As far as, you know, what you offer on Twitter, is this something that you do, you know, completely publicly, or do you also have a private feed that you post to just for those that are maybe looking to follow uh, your content and some of your trades, where's the best way that they can, they can find that. So I currently have one public Twitter, which is the only one that I post to uh, it's at theta warrior. And I, uh, I don't have a private feed yet. Um, but I have had so many requests and people interested in it is really truly the only reason why I've even considered doing it. Um, I'm a full-time trader. That's how I make my living. And, um, you know, if I could make a private Twitter to help other people, you know, get a little bit more insight, um, you know, I'm, I'm, all, I'm open to doing that. But currently right now, it's uh, everything that I post is, is on my public Twitter. Awesome. I love it. Well, you guys know where to find them at Theta Warrior on Twitter. We really appreciate you coming on and going over some of these different names that you're watching definitely uh, will be interesting to see if we do pull back into the coming week or so um, going into, you know, August and September, we do have a little bit of a decrease in the seasonality um, definitely going into September. But um, you know, remember as, as Theta said, price action over everything, you can have a hundred percent win rate over the last 20 years for something. But if the price action isn't showing for that, maybe time frame, maybe the month of July, has a strong win rate, but the price action's not showing that, that's what you have to follow. So um, really appreciate all the details that you went over today. And we're looking forward to hopefully doing another Thursday live stream uh, sometime soon again. Yeah, I agree. And thank you again for having me. I'll just close by saying, you know, in no way, shape or form am I bearish. Um, I think this market will likely continue higher. Um, you know, sometimes overbought markets will continue to be overbought. You know, the classic um, the market can remain irrational longer than you can remain solvent. I just think this is a time that we should be cautious um, just based on how extended everything is right now. But who knows? Maybe we trade up here before we get the pullback. But anyway, thank you as always. It's a pleasure speaking with you guys and uh, good luck in the market yourself.
Hey, thank you. All righty, let's move on to the next segment. All righty, let's look at some chart requests that we always do on Friday. So what I do is I just go on Twitter, ask everybody to pick a chart and charts that come up multiple times. That's kind of what we choose uh, some of those tickers. So um, first one is Tesla. Uh, Tesla had a pretty interesting week. So on the daily side of things, you can see I've anchored the volume by price from the swing high. And then I've anchored the volume uh, weighted average price from the swing low. And you'll see uh, once this area was lost right around 6 to 80, we were able to move down very quickly through this volume gap. And this, this works the same way to the upside. Anytime you have a volume gap above and you start to move up, you can move very quickly through it. In this case, we moved very quickly down through the volume gap right to the swing low anchored view app as well as this next level of volume uh, shown by the volume by price got a nice bounce and moved pretty quickly back up through that volume gap uh, because of that lack of liquidity so uh, we'll have to see what happens but on the weekly side of things not the strongest weekly uh, close here you can see that we were rejected right at that uh, all-time high anchored view app from january and so uh you know not only the anchored view app but also this trend line resistance so until we break through both of these, that's going to definitely be uh, the area that kind of makes or breaks this breakout. Uh, next one is Wish. Uh, a lot of people are uh, watching Wish, and so that's why we're definitely looking at it. On the four-hour chart, you can see here that we do have this uh, falling wedge breakout. So if we anchor the volume by price from this swing high, you'll see here that we do have a little bit of a volume shell forming here. And, um, you know, if we do move up next week, there's not a ton of liquidity until you get up to around 12, 12 dollars to around 1250. And so the anchored view app from that swing high is also right around 1250. So that, that is definitely an area to watch going into next week. And then on the weekly side of things, you can see here that we simply just broke out and then possibly just retesting this resistance line, possibly acting as support going into the week ahead. So, um, a lot of people are very bearish on this now, um, and a lot of people bought a little too high, and now it's you know kind of a mix of capitulation and people trying to short. But you can see here that we're still above this previous resistance, and that possibly could be the support area that we needed to bounce off, or at least near uh, in the last week. So next one is Snow. Snowflake is finally starting to move here. So if we push this back to the daily chart, you'll see here that we had a really nice ascending triangle breakout. If I turn off the volume by price here, you can see we just went straight up here. So um, a really nice move. And if you look at the longer term side of things, you'll see if we anchored the volume by price from the all time highs, we did have kind of that volume shelf launch pad forming here for the last two months. And so you can see here that we finally got the move. We actually closed above the anchor view app from the all time highs which is definitely very bullish. It, we have not closed above that anchor view app yet uh, since the all-time highs were reached. So that is definitely a big status quo changer and possibly a really strong mover going into the weeks ahead. Now, the next one is PLTR, everybody's uh, favorite or maybe not favorite after this last week. But you can see here that pretty much you just had a pullback with the rest of the growth names and pretty much pulled back right to the swing low anchored view app. You can see here that we did undercut it a little bit, but then it did close above on Friday. You can see here that the, uh, the gap above is still way up here around 31. So that would be kind of the bull target over the next couple months. Now on the weekly side of things, you'll see here that if I anchor the volume by price from the IPO, we're pretty much trading right where a majority of shares are holding since the IPO. So um, a lot of shares uh, trading here or have traded here means that a lot of people are either at break even or a little below um, break even with an unrealized loss. So we'll have to see if this does uh, dry up some supply. But if we do continue to break down, watch for a potential test, not, you know, not guaranteed by any means, but a possible test would be around 20, 50 to 21 below. And we just have to see how long that took. If it took three or four weeks, you know, you may be uh, a little closer to 22 on this trend line. So remember, these trend lines are a function of time. As time goes by, the trend line is going up. So your support would also be at a higher point if it did take a while for that to move. So that is PLTR. Next one is UPST. UPST is one that a lot of people have uh, been frustrated with. It hasn't really done anything uh, over the last really 
three to four weeks. You can see here that we are still trading below the swing high and the swing low anchored VWAPs here. And that's right around 131 or so. And so you can see here that on the weekly chart, we've had actually one, two, three, four, five red weeks in a, uh, in a row. And you can see here that we do have a pretty big volume shelf, pretty similar to what we just talked about on PLTR. And we have that confluence of this support trend line. And so this would possibly be an area where price can catch a bid. And this may be um, an interesting one to watch into the next couple of weeks. Now, going into the next one, BABA, this one got absolutely crushed this week. And you can see here on the daily chart, we did undercut this previous uh, support trend line a little bit before moving up on Friday, almost filling this gap above, not fully. But you can also see on the weekly chart, this is not looking great. I mean, we did technically close below this trend line for the first time since uh, June of 2020. So you can see we have tested it a couple of times, but we didn't actually close below it until this week. So not what I'd call the strongest close, but we'll have to see what happens there. We actually did break 200 earlier in the week. So, uh, you know, do we retest 200? We'll just have to see. But going into uh, the monthly seasonality, you can see July is generally a pretty strong month with a 100% win rate. But going into uh, you know, the next couple of weeks, you can see here that the price action is not necessarily supporting that strong seasonality. So remember, you always want to look at price action and then compare that with the seasonality. Just because you have a 100% win rate for July doesn't mean anything if the chart looks like, uh, you know, like it's breaking down, which in this case it is. So going into August, September, October, you can see these win rates do decline going into the rest of the year. So that is something to keep in mind. And we're looking back since uh, January of 2016 here as well. Last one is Viacom, V-I-A-C. This one is, uh, this one's definitely uh, just kind of chopping around. I mean, this, this waterfall was insane. I mean, this was at nine, pretty much a hundred bucks, 99 bucks. Now we're trading at 42. We are making higher lows though. So that is something to consider on the shorter term trend here that we are definitely hitting higher lows. We had a pretty strong day on Friday. So you can see here that, you know, if we did continue up, we'd need to break through this anchored VWAP right around 4430 or so. And until then it's kind of stuck. Now on the weekly side of things, you'll see here, if we anchor the volume by price from this low point, you'll see we have a little bit of a rounded bottom and we've got this volume shelf here forming. So that is a little bit of a uh, a little bit of a bull thesis argument there, but at the same time, we really need to bounce off of this volume shelf to get going. So, all in all, a little promising, but for the most part, this thing's just been stuck. It's eating up options premiums, I'm sure. Um, and so, on the seasonality side, 60% win rate for July, 40% win rate for August. We'll just have to see how this plays out, but it is still down quite a bit from that high that we saw. And uh, a lot of that was due to just really over leveraged trading. And then a lot of traders got blown up here um, when we had that huge hedge fund blow up. Uh, I forgot it was Bill Huang or Huang, but I, I forgot what his hedge fund was called. But either way, that's that was your move. That was a huge liquidation of capital. So it's going to take a while for the dust to settle. I don't think it's still settled yet. So all in all, hopefully these chart requests were helpful in seeing a couple individual names going into the week and weeks ahead, the rest of July, really, uh, with the seasonality side of things. And remember, if you do enjoy these uh, episodes, like and subscribe, and you'll always get a notification when we're about to go uh, live again. And so uh, if you have any questions, as always, we do have the customer success team available at any time, as well as our DMs are open on TrendSpider. So feel free to send us a message if you have any questions. Everybody have a great Sunday and thanks for watching.